Morning, family. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, you guys sound absolutely incredible in everything that we've done today. Uh, super uh, awesome shout out to uh, Matt for uh, some incredible song leading. Amen. Uh, thank you, Paula, and uh, and of course Muhammad for giving us an incredible welcome. For for Leap sharing his heart so uh, so vulnerably, bro. It, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, and the song that they performed afterwards, absolutely beautiful. And Helen, always, it's, uh, it's a treat to listen to you share your heart. Thank you so much. Uh, this morning, I have the privilege and the honor of preaching a, a lesson for you guys. Uh, I realized uh, one of the big mistakes that I make as a young guy, a young Latino specifically, is that we get caught up with the show. And we get caught up on trying to make our stories and our lessons fit the Word of God as opposed to the Word of God sculpting exactly what the message should be. Amen. And so this morning, we're going to go ahead and let the Word of God speak. We're going to let the Word of God actually lead us through this lesson. And we're going to turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Let's go there. The title of the lesson this morning is Because of Him, I Can. Amen? amen. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to go ahead and read in verse 1. Can I get an amen when you're there? Amen. amen. Awesome. Some Bible scholars in the house. Verse 1, it says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear Friends, and just like any time that you read in the Bible, you see the word therefore, you got to ask yourself, what's it there for? Well, let's see what it says in chapter 3 in verse 17 as to what Paul is talking to the church in Philippi about. Verse 17, it says, join together in following my example. Brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before and now tell you again, with, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We see that Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi. Guys, you need to stand firm in the Lord. Why? Because the spiritual war is breaking out. And what I've realized is uh, throughout the years, I've been a disciple for three years now, thank God. And I've seen that the spiritual war is so true. It's something that so often we can kind of not, not, not pay much attention to. We, we, don't, we don't really see the gravity of what Satan is doing around the world. But I've realized that not only does Satan attack the church and the world attack the church, like it says here in the scriptures, it says many are enemies of Christ. So many is a majority. But I've also seen that a lot of the times the spiritual warfare happens within the church. Sin can creep in. Division can start. Brothers and sisters toiling about foolishness. And there is a rift and a giant divide between brothers and sisters. We see that Paul, he says it in chapter 4, we're going to keep reading in verse 2, and we're going to see exactly how bad the situation was in the church. Verse 2, it says, I plead with Edia, and I plead with Cynthia, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. We see that Paul is telling the church, he's saying, guys, this issue needs to be resolved. And you always, whenever we read the scriptures and there's a command given or an encouragement and admonishment given to the, uh, to the people, it's because they weren't doing that. So here we see that Paul was talking to these sisters specifically. He said, they need to be of the same mind. There was some conflict. There was some division. Guys, there, there's so many things that we can be divided on. Who's the best artist in the world? You know what I mean? Like, who's the best rapper? Who's the best athlete? LeBron James, of course. Uh, you know, there's so many things that we can go ahead and allow to divide us as the brothers and sisters in the family of God. But here Paul specifically says, I want them to be of the same mind. Now, we got to ask ourselves, though, what does that mean to have the same mind as Jesus? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2 and read about exactly how Jesus conducted himself in verse 5. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
We see here that the attitude and the mindset of Jesus is to be humble. The only way that we can be of the same mind with one another is if we are humble. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to be completely unified with our brothers and sisters. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 4, where we get our first point. And in verse 1, it says, stand firm in the Lord in this way. Dear friends, that's our first point. Stand firm in the Lord. And a lot of the times we hear this term, stand firm, and it's like, well, okay, what does that mean? Like standing like kind of like, or is it standing like, you know, like the brothers do when the sisters walk in and, you know, you, you have an interest and you're like. <laughs> it says stand firm in the battle against the world. To stand firm is to stand with conviction. And that's what I love about this church is that this church is full of conviction. It's not full of comedians. Although Matt is funny, dad jokes are funny. But this is a church full of conviction. And we see that in the scriptures, our conviction on being like Jesus is the only way that we can be at a heart and soul level. I found it really interesting that these two names, Edia and Synthic, as well as the name of Clement, come up only once in this, in this book. And I thought about it, and I'm like, man, if my name was only to come up once in the Bible, would I want it to be a scripture telling me, hey, you got to be of the same mind as this person? Or would I want to be known as a person that was a great companion in the battle? I want to ask you this morning, what would the Bible say about you? A man of great faith or a man that lacks faith? We see that a lot of the times Paul needed to correct the church because, the, the, honestly, the church is made up of sinful people. Guys, like, honestly, if you look around, these are beautiful people. But the thing is, we all have sin. We all bring sin to the table, as well as time, talent, and and, and finances, of course. But the thing is, we need to understand that our sin, it, it, we can't let our sin supersede the Word of God in terms of importance. Guys, the Word of God is so necessary. It's the only way that we can actually talk to each other and not get bitter all the time. Like, I love the fact that, that I can have the same mind and attitude with the brothers in the campus ministry. You know, I wanted to share real quick, I know that, uh, you know, Brandon and I, we've been spending a lot of time together lately, and it's been super, super encouraging. But Brandon and I, we're not always unified, I, I realize, I realize. Brandon and I are very different. Brandon is very, you know, very funny, very charismatic, uh, very handsome, and me, I'm the opposite. <laughs> but, 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 but him and I, we, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he gave me a call, and, and he was like, bro, I need to talk to you for five minutes. And I'm like, Sweet. Five minutes, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, because you know how at the end of the day, you just want to go to sleep. It's 11 o'clock, and he's like, bro, I just need to tell you something. I'm completely, I just feel neglected by you. I feel like you're not leading the people correctly. And he's just spewing all of his heart out, and I'm like, whoa, this is intense. But I realized that a sinful man would have easily been like, well, bro, it's your fault. Hang up, and then go to sleep. But, but, but because of the example that Matt's played in my life, the example that Jesus plays in our lives, the first thing I did was, after he shared everything he said, bro, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've failed you. And the thing is, we went ahead and talked for, I think it was an hour and 15 minutes. So five minutes went to an hour and 15 minutes. And, and it, I, but I realized the only reason why we were willing to do that is because this man loves God, and I love God, and we want to be of the same mind. And so I want to give us a practical with this point, guys, is, is if there's any disunity with any brother or sister in the church right now, you, can, you know when you're disunified. You can feel it. There's a sin of weirdness, you know, when they come into the room. It's like, yeah, bro. You avoid all eye contact. You avoid even talking to the person. And, 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 you just, and when, when their name comes up, you're just kind of cringing in your soul. I want to give us a challenge. And in all seriousness, if there's any disunity, you get rid of it today. Before this evening, if, before you go home and hit your head on the pillow, you get completely unified with your brother and sister and give God the glory on that. We need to stand firm, guys, in the battle. Guys, the, the world is against us. Like, you, you should see how much persecution the brothers and sisters get all around the world. Brothers and sisters getting beaten by their own family members for the sake of the gospel. Being made fun of, being ostracized by your friends. It's the worst feeling in the world. And then what's, what's even more intense is, what about when inside of the church we start having problems? Oh it's like everywhere you go, there's no defense. Everywhere you go, there's a problem. But what's amazing is that if we stand firm in the Lord, we'll make it happen. And we'll be victorious and have our names written in the book of life like we saw here. Let's, read, let's keep our reading in Philippians chapter 4. 
It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. You ever have somebody have to tell you something twice in order for you to get it? Yeah. We see Paul had that heart. He was like, guys, I need you to rejoice. So we get our second point. Rejoice in the Lord always. The word rejoice is defined as, as a, a having of, it says to feel or show great joy or delight. But then I looked up the archaic de definition, like back in the day, you know, when the dinosaurs roamed. It says here that the word rejoice is to cause joy to someone. Oh, wow. So we see that in the scriptures, it wasn't a matter of, hey, you need to feel good. No, you need to help others have joy. So when the scriptures is calling us to rejoice always, it's not, hey, you got to be happy all the time. It's, hey, you got to give your heart to those around you and give them joy. What an incredible conviction that Paul had. And we see in verse 5, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. There's nothing more incredible than being around somebody that's gentle. You know, like Deborah, you know, Deborah's super, super gentle, super, super. Even when, when I mess up and I make dumb comments, she's like, yeah, I forgive you. And then it's, it's, it's awesome. But there's something about someone that has gentleness in their character. And I want to ask you this morning, do you have gentleness? Is it evident to everyone? Or is it only evident to your husband? Or is it only evident to your circle of friends that, you know, you guys are the, you, you're only nice to one another? Or is it evident to every single person? I believe if we become men and women who have that gentleness that's evident to all, this church will multiply exponentially. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, that's a command. Don't be anxious. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, will tra which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Do you think it's important to rejoice? I realize as, as disciples here in Miami, I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's been a little hard coming down here to plant this church. And I think the one thing that I've seen is that there's a lack of rejoicing. It, 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 when the suffering comes, it's very easy for us to shy back. And, and I realize it, it, it's not that, that, that we're just being overwhelmed by the situation. It's that we're not doing what it says in verses 6 to 7. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You could tell a lot about a man by his prayer life. I know for me, uh, I went to India with, with Matt, Helen, Ted, and, and Brandon. It was probably the most incredible experience of my life in India while I was with the disciples. But going to India and coming back from India, it was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> I wanted to share a little bit, and, and, and I wanted to just kind of let you guys in a little bit on, on what happened exactly with Brandon and I on our way to and fro from India. Um, it, it was probably, um, you guys ever have those moments where you feel like no one's there for you? And you're completely abandoned and no one can help you? So Brandon and I, we were flying from Fort Lauderdale Airport over to Chennai, India. We went from Fort Lauderdale to Jersey, from Jersey to Delhi, from Delhi to Chennai. Make sense? We went ahead and got on our flight. We made it to Jersey. It was incredible. And, and honestly, like, the excitement on Brandon and I's, like, behalf, like, like, we were just like, this is going to be the greatest experience of life. We're going to be so unified. We're Paul and Timothy. We're Elijah and Elisha. We're, 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 we're God and Jesus. Like, like, we're just so excited. We make it to Jersey. We get, uh, it's a delayed flight because of air traffic and, and traffic control throwing stuff off. We miss our flight to go from Jersey to Delhi. So we had to stay the night at a hotel that, that we had to pay for. Like, we, we went to the customer service people, and they said, yeah, you know you're not getting a hotel from us, right? And I looked at Brandon, and like, the thing is, at that point, we were both spiritual. <laughs> and Brandon was like, amen, we'll do this thing. Brandon's clothes was on the, uh, on the, on the, on the plane on its way to Chennai. So Brandon had no clothes. I, I lent him clothes. You looked great in my clothes. Um, <laughs> we are in Jersey. We stay the night. We show up to the airport 24 hours after that for our next flight to go to Delhi. We go to Delhi. It was a 14-15 you know, hour flight. We get to Delhi and before we left there, I went, we went to the customer service people and, and Brandon's tickets, everything printed out correctly going from his flight from Delhi to Chennai, uh, if I'm not mistaken. My tickets, they didn't print because they said, oh sir, you'll just have to get it when you get over there. And I'm like, okay. Like, no, I'm, I'm sure that's a lie. We fly over to, to, to Delhi. We get to Delhi, and 
and I go to the customer service people and I'm like, hello, I, I, I need my flight ticket. And they say, okay, what's your name? They looked up my information, nothing was on their system. And of course, Brandon's, everything was perfectly fine. But because we missed our flight, they weren't able to give us the same flight the day after to go from Delhi to Chennai. You guys with me? So Brandon and I had to pay $115 for new flights. Me already going to India is like there is a God. You know what I mean? Like, like I don't have money like that. I'm not, you know, Bill Gates here. <laughs> we get the ticket, and then Brandon and I at that point, we're like, hmm, okay, let's be spiritual. We're still, we're, we're still fighting in our hearts. Conference goes awesome. We get to Chennai. God, you know, God's glorified. Coming back from Chennai, we fly from Chennai to Mumbai. We go to the airport. Brandon's information, of course, works. Everything, it's, everything's perfect. And I'm like, bro, that's incredible. And it's my turn to check in. I go up to the lady. I'm like, hello, my name is Isaac. Here's my passport. And I'm super fired up. I'm like, oh, we're going back home. God is great. They try to log in my information, and their whole system crashes. All of my information completely erased from the United Airlines uh, interface. And so the lady, the, the gentleman is looking at me. He's like, sir, we cannot do nothing. <laughs> and in my heart, in my heart, I was somewhat spiritual. I think Brandon would agree. I was somewhat spiritual at that point. And I was like, okay, amen. I went with the customer associate, walked off to an office. Sir, the only flight, the only ticket that you can buy is one for $550. And this was only from Chennai to Mumbai. Guys, it's in the same con country. It's like me flying from here to uh, California, paying $550 for a ticket. And so I'm in my heart. I'm like, I don't have this money, dude. And the lady says, well, if you don't pay, you don't go. You stay here. And in my heart, I'm like, no way, dude. I don't want to stay in India, man. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be here. And I tried to pray. And, and the thing is, I realized I was praying the right things, but my heart wasn't changing. I was praying, God, help me out in this situation, please, Lord. I don't know what I'm doing. But it was just me saying the things that I needed to say. But my heart wasn't transforming and becoming like that of Jesus. We, I, I buy the ticket on my credit card, and it, 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 it hurt me, trust me. She swiped it, and she's like, here's your receipt. And I'm like, <laughs> I have, and I run, I, I think it was, the, 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 the airport in, in Chennai is huge, actually. So I run about half a mile uh, in, in less than 10 minutes, which is impressive for me, um, <laughs> to get to the terminal on time. And there's Ted Green and Brandon Green just smiling and enjoying their life. <laughs> and I sit down, and, and, and you ever have your brothers try to get into your heart? And you're just like, yeah, bro, I'm good. I'm good, bro. And your heart is completely wicked and hateful towards God. I saw myself get there. Because, guys, I, money for me has always been a struggle. I, I grew up here in Hialeah. I, my, I, lived, I, I literally have had roommates for my whole entire life, four roommates at a minimum in one room. Lived in my, with my grandpa and my two brothers in one room. Went to Gainesville. I lived with six men in, in one apartment building. I lived in New York with three guys in one uh, college dorm at St. John's University. I'm living right now with Andres in a space that's the size of this stage, probably. And it's a struggle for me. Finances has always been something that's hard because I always feel like I never have enough. We go to Mumbai. We get to Mumbai, and the, t the plane uh, de was delayed, and we had to literally, I think we ran something like half a mile to get to where we needed to go for the next leg of the flight, which is from Mumbai to the rest of Brussels and all of that good stuff. We get to the ticket counter at, in Mumbai, Brandon's information <laughs> works perfectly. God loves Brandon. <laughs> I, go, I go up, to, I go up to, the, to the person who gives me the tickets, and, and the, the first, and, and they try to log in my information, and, and, and he went ahead and said, your information is not here. And, and at that point, um, it was like my entire life fell apart. I don't know why. I, I looked at that guy. And, and, and Brandon was right next to me, he saw it all, and I'm like, no, no, this will not happen. You're going to get me on that flight. I'm tired of this. You've taken advantage of me every single time. Why? Brandon watching all of that. He saw me sin to a man I've never even met in my life. My anger, my boiling frustration because of my situation I wanted to take control instead of giving it to God. Wow. I prayed zero times on that flight. 
We were, st we were stuck in the airport for six hours while they were trying to figure out our situation from 11 o'clock to 5 in the morning. And throughout that whole time, I was, I was ticked off. Brandon, was, Brandon shared with me the scripture, you know, two is better than one. When one falls, the other one will lift the other up. <laughs> And I was, and, but, 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 but I was so grateful that I was with a disciple, that I was with a brother who was going to lift up my arms and help me out in this. I go off to use the bathroom in, in the last 20 minutes of, of that six-hour gap, and I'm like, God, you know what? I give up, man. You've broken me. Honestly, I'm done. Like, you, you, what else can you take from me? My life is in shambles. My family is broken. Coming back home to living in someone's efficiency that I don't even have a bathroom to use. I walk to the bathroom, guys. I literally walk to the Publix across the street to use the bathroom in the morning because the lady in the house is using it. It's, it's so depressing. And I was like, God, you've broken me. I don't have anything else. I'm going to school with all these people that are successful. They're going to make millions of dollars, and I'm giving it all up all for you. Why are you putting me through this? And it hurts so much. And then I, and I, and I remember specifically praying. I, was, I saw Brandon in my sight from here to the, to the fire extinguisher over there. I, I saw him at the distance. I'm like, you know what, God, I, I can't do it anymore. Your will be done, not mine. I give up. Like, like I, I, I'm, I'm surrendered to whatever you want to do to me. I, I, I'm sorry for being prideful. I'm sorry for letting this whole conference go in vain just because I'm so frustrated. I walk up to the ticket counter person, and they're like, yeah, sir, so we figured out everything for your flight. You're going to be on the next flight. We're going to give you a hotel night stay just so you don't have to wait for 12 hours in the airport. You have breakfast and lunch included. And, and, and then Brandon was there, and he's like, oh, cool. <laughs> but the reason I share that is because verses 4 to 7, I never understood until I think about a week ago, where, where everything, Paul says here that everything should be in our prayers. Not just the adversity, not just the good stuff, but every part of our hearts and every part of our lives. So that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your mind and heart. Because my mind and heart at that time, it was so, it was, it, everything was bothering me. The smell of stuff over there. The looks that I was getting. The food over there. I, and the, the worst part of it all is when we were in Mumbai, I contracted an ear infection and a stomach virus. So I literally was in the plane, and I was dying. I couldn't use the restroom. The guy that I was sitting in the middle of an aisle, the guy literally put on a face mask, and he was, like, falling asleep because he, he knew that I was sick, and he gave me the stank eye of the century. Like, just, like, I asked him, for, I asked him to borrow his pen so I can write the stuff for customs, and he threw the pen out after I used it. Like, I felt like, I felt like one of the men and the women that were in the colony that we were serving, completely rejected by everyone. But I realized that God never rejects his people. Verse 8, let's read this. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Guys, I realize as a church... I've seen it in myself, and, I, and, I, and, I've, and I've honestly, I've gotten open with Matt. I've gotten open with the men of God in my life, and I've chosen to repent radically in this. Like, I'm, I'm done with the victim mentality. I'm done with the foolishness of, like, the woe is me. God, why do you hate me? And going ahead and actually being a man of God. And I want to give us the challenge as well this morning, all the men and the women in this congregation, to think about whatever is pure, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is holy, and understand that God is going to be with you. The specific practical is pray every, every day, 30 minutes on your knees, about every single thing in your heart. Every single thing. Because I realize we can come into the, the fellowship relying on other people's relationship with God instead of our own relationship with God. Are you guys with me? Let's keep on reading in verse 10. We're going to come in for a landing here soon. Soon. Verse 10, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. How does he do it? Verse 13, I can do all this Amen. through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in your troubles, in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except for you only. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Guys, in the first century, the churches sent special missions for aid. 
How incredible is it that this church is doing the same thing that the scriptures were doing? That should encourage you in the Lord. Verse 18, or 17, sorry, it says, Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from uh, Epaphroditus, sorry about that one, the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. Point number three, God will meet all your needs. Amen. This point hits my heart because, because I see that so often my circumstances dictate my relationship with God. And, and I see the brothers and sisters overseas, and I wanted to share just a quick story of, 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 of what's happening over there um, around the world uh, in our sister churches. Specifically, it's with uh, the churches in Haiti. I think it was awesome that Helen shared about uh, the churches in India, um, which allows me to share here about the churches in Haiti. And one thing that we see in Haiti, guys, you've seen it time and time again. Earthquakes, tsunamis, poverty, destruction, political corruption. Time upon time, things that I don't know about you, but if we face that in this country, all of us would fall away probably. Because of just how unlikely it is that we face that kind of stuff. I want to share about the miracles that God is doing in the incredible church in Haiti. This is a, a written from our brother, Blaise Fumba. He's the overseeing evangelist of Haiti. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. At the beginning of the month of April, the Lord blessed the international Christian churches of the nation of Haiti with the forming of a ninth church, guys. In Haiti, we have nine churches as a fellowship. That's incredible. It says here, Alexis, uh, John Bernard, and 13 other leaders of our Haitian congregations in Port-au-Prince, St. Mark, uh, uh, Mirabalias, and ja uh, Jack Mel, sorry about that, answered the call of a desperate denominational church in the city of Serial, an hour and a half away from Port-au-Prince. Our team landed there to preach and teach the first principle series to over 100 people. Guys, like imagine a group of people just randomly coming together and being taught the scriptures just like this, like just somebody coming in from out of town and you listening to what this person has to say. Check out the miracle. After five days only of intense Bible studies, the Lord blessed their efforts with 21 baptisms, six of them being preachers in Haiti, guys. That's absolutely incredible. And the thing is, I want us to get in this mindset now because we see that in the scriptures, Paul expected lightning repentance. He expected the men and women of God to see the situation and turn the other way and turn to God instead. I want to encourage us this morning that God will meet all of your needs. The same way he did for our brothers and sisters in Haiti. Guys, they are living in poverty, and yet God is moving ever so powerfully. Guys, here in a nation where we're so, we're so affluent and so blessed, don't you think God wants to do immeasurably more? Yeah. Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians. We see all these different churches. They struggled, but the thing is they overcame. This morning, church, I, I believe, and, and this will be the last uh, practical I want to give us, is to trust God. Give all of that special missions. Give your contribution, but most importantly, give your heart. Yeah. As Americans, we don't give our heart enough. Yeah. We're so desensitized. We, we, we don't connect anymore. Because I want to encourage us as a congregation to never have that hard heart that is formed from bitterness and the deceiving of sin. Give all of our special missions. It says here, we read it also in Philippians chapter 3, that it says that our citizenship is in heaven, guys. And the, the fact that we have that, that precious gift. Guys, you die. Those that are baptized disciples of Jesus Christ, like Jasmine will be in a few minutes here, will go to heaven. Today, if you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to study the Bible. Get radical. Have lightning repentance and know that God will meet all of your needs. So this morning, church, I really want to Give us the encouragement like Paul did to the church to stand firm in the Lord. Rejoice always and know that he's got you. And understand that our God will fulfill all of your needs. To God be the glory.